Thank you, Wayne. It's, uh, it's always good to be in New Mexico. I, uh, Kathy can't, couldn't make it because of the hurricane, and I told her I'd be happy to come to New Mexico. I was also the deputy manager out at the White Sands Test Facility for a little while. I did warn Kathy that you know, I might not make it back quite in time, because I do love it out here. Um, how do we change the slides here? That would be something good to have. It must be this, this gizmo here. Or can somebody advance the slides here? There we go. All right. Uh, commercial Crew has been, I've been the deputy program manager for, uh, since last November, and uh, it's really a, an exciting program. It certainly is a, a new way of doing business for NASA, where we are collaborating with industry. And while we set very high level requirements and some standards for, uh, for the companies to meet relative to our safety requirements, we really let Boeing and SpaceX go off and innovate and build their systems uh, the best way that they know how, taking the strengths of both companies and applying them to human spaceflight. And, and of course, they retain ownership of their systems, they own the IP, and we just purchase the service. So it's essentially a very unique way of doing things. Um, we're in the process of building two unique human spaceflight transportation systems. From a NASA perspective, we think that's a really good thing to ensure a, uh, multiple paths to go to the International Space Station. Uh, and of course, as Phil talked about in his presentation, that really is the start of this commercial market in LEO. We've started that with our CRS, our commercial resupply services to station. Commercial crew is the next step, and then we're moving on to, to other things. Commercial crew is a, a great endeavor in terms of utilization of the space station. Um, today on the International Space Station, the limiting uh, item for how much science and research we can get done really is crew time, uh, how many uh, U.S. and international crew members we have on the U.S. side to execute that science. And so commercial crew is going to help that today. The Soyuz provides three crew members per, per flight up and down. Commercial crew vehicles, they're designed to provide four. So it essentially doubles the amount of research we can get on the U.S. side. And again, this innovative new way of doing business, I think, helps NASA really with our journey to Mars as we explore new cost-effective ways to procure systems or services. Uh, I think that's a pathfinder for how we may do business in the future for Mars. So we're, we're sort of trying this out with low Earth orbit first, which is a little bit more forgiving environment than exploration, but really is the commercial crew program is a part of that journey to Mars. Uh, of course, uh, Boeing and SpaceX are uh, in the midst of uh, continuing to develop and finalize their system designs. Uh, we really uh, started working in earnest. Uh, this January, it'll be two years. So if you think about what's transpired in those two years, it's really been an incredible time frame. Uh, right now, both companies, and, and John and Benji will talk more about it, are in the middle of qualification of many of their systems and components all across the country. Uh, and so they're in that really busy, hot, what I would call the hard phase of development, where you're really trying to qualify your systems for space flight. Uh, they're in the middle of constructing flight hardware, uh, structural test articles on both sides, and uh, testing that hardware for the rigors of space flight. Um, you can see in the, in the graphic here, uh, launch pads. Uh, it's really been incredible over the last 18 months to see the launch pads come together in Florida. Both the ULA Complex 41 has a crew access arm now uh, for the Atlas vehicle, which the crew will go across and get into the Starliner vehicle, a major transformation. And then pad 39A, the old shuttle launch pad, uh, SpaceX is making phenomenal progress there. And both companies, on, on the leftmost graphic, you can see a parachute drop test. They're both into parachute testing, which is a critical entry system. So if you kind of look back of where we started with from contract award to now, it's kind of incredible the amount of, of progress uh, in hardware development and qualification testing that's happening. And I know John and Benji will talk more about that. Uh, we've also been preparing for these vehicles on the International Space Station. Uh, just recently in August, uh, we installed uh, IDA-2, the International Docking Adapter-2, on the International Space Station. Uh, Kate Rubens and Jeff Williams did that spacewalk. And so we essentially now have that door, the entryway, to the space station installed uh, and, uh, and ready to go and all checked out for the vehicle. So that was a, that was a huge undertaking by the International Space Station program. Uh, they have the second International Docking Adapter 3. Uh, IDA 2 went on the forward 
uh, part of the space station. Uh, the other one will go on the, on the Zenith port. Uh, that's being targeted for a late 2017 launch. And it's kind of interesting to me, this really embodies commercial space flight. Uh, the Ida was built by Boeing, launched in a, an, in a Dragon trunk and taken to the space station. So that just shows how the diverse partnerships are all working together for a common good. We've also laid in the communications for the commercial crew vehicles, something called C2V2, common communications for vehicle, visiting vehicles. We have two new radios on the space station and a set of antennas that have been, uh, been installed and checked out and they're ready to go so that the crew as they approach the station uh, can talk to the, talk to the station crew and we can have data and communications exchanged back and forth. And then uh, in terms of spacewalks, uh, in order to do that, we had one spacewalk to install the international docking adapter, and then two others where we installed uh, some 800 feet of cable, uh, antennas, laser reflectors, and so on. So in orbit, things are transforming to get ready for the commercial vehicles as well. And then, of course, we've seen uh, our commercial crew astronauts working uh, hand in hand with both Boeing and SpaceX. Uh, Sonny Williams, Bob Bankin, Eric Bowe, and Doug Hurley were named uh, a little over a year ago. They've been working hand in hand uh, with both teams, uh, understanding how the displays will be laid out uh, in both vehicles, uh, helping design some of the displays and the systems and, and giving their human spaceflight experience. Uh, all of them have shuttle experience and have flown on the space shuttle. And of course, Sonny has spent time on the space station for a long duration flight. So they've been collaborating uh, back and forth. We've also begun to talk to our international partners. They're very excited about these two new commercial vehicles and they want to know more all the time. We're talking to them about the safety standards, how the vehicles are designed. We're starting to have those discussions and working with both Boeing and SpaceX to, to try to share data back and forth with the partners. They'll be flying on these vehicles. And so we're beginning that dialogue as well. So a very exciting time. And then finally, uh, lots of benefits for commercial crew. I already talked about the research. Uh, today on the space station, we average maybe 60 hours of science research a week. Uh, we'll up that, we'll double that with another crew member. Uh, we'll be able to bring cargo back and forth. We'll have another avenue to take a lot of the research on the space station is the human research, uh, how humans behave in the zero-g environment, muscles, heart, um, all those sorts of things, be able to get those samples uh, back and forth on these vehicles. And then uh, we also have ability to fly cargo up very late uh, with, with both the Boeing and the SpaceX vehicles. And then, of course, the overall objectives is transport four crews safely, and our requirements are all designed to do that. The vehicles will both be a lifeboat uh, and will be at the space station for the entire time the crew's there for the increment. That's on the order of up to six or seven months. And then uh, we're able to carry up quite a number of, uh, number of pounds of cargo, almost 220 pounds of cargo in these vehicles. And I think that's my last slide. So I think with that, I will turn it over to John Mulholland from Boeing, and he'll talk a little bit about their great progress on CST-100. Good. All right, thank you. And Pat, thanks again for another great conference. All right, let's see what we got. I can wing this if I need to. All right, thanks. All right, let's see, I think. I was starting with the video that's not there. No. Ignition, lift off. Let's see, can I go back a chart? Hmm. Maybe that's not it. Okay, hey, sorry about my confusion up here. Um, hey, thank you guys very much. When you look at uh, CST 104, four main swim lanes that we have uh, when we look at the development program. First is a spacecraft. Uh, it's a reusable spacecraft. We've gotten a firm configuration on it, which is an internal milestone that's pretty important to us in, uh, in January of this year. <clears throat> a big focus on using flight-proven technology. Uh, the biggest 
Um, part of the uh, integrated spacecraft, obviously, is the Atlas V launch vehicle. Uh, unparalleled technical and schedule reliability, which is a big reason why I was selected for, for our initial flights uh, with 65 successful missions and counting. Uh, from a mission operations, you know, we decided <clears throat> to, to reduce the overall risk to partner back with the uh, mission operations team at the Johnson Space Center who have done the planned train fly portion of the mission uh, for every domestic human space flight. So partnering with them and they are fully embedded on our team. And in ground processing, we're using the old OPF-3. Uh, I'd like to report that there was minimal damage to the facility on Hurricane Matthew, so we're back up in production on the factory floor. Just a little bit on the spacecraft. I'm trying to get through this pretty quick, so we've got time for questions. Uh, Two-piece spacecraft, reusable crew module that can fly up to 10, flying, 10 times. Nominally lands um, a combination of parachutes and airbags in one of five locations uh, out here in the west part of the western United States. Um, White Sands Missile Range being one of them, and a disposable service module. So all the abort, on-orbit, deorbit propulsion uh, in that uh, cylindrical section on the bottom. And once you do the deorbit burn, it separates, burns up on re-entry. Um, from an Atlas V perspective, you know, heritage vehicle with some new modifications. Obviously, the crew access tower and the full construction has been complete, as Mike mentioned, on the crew access tower. And working through emergency detection, I won't go through everything since Mike did. The RL-10 firing that you saw in the, uh, on the earlier video was the acceptance test for one of the RL-10s that's going to be used on the crew flight test. So a lot of progress uh, getting the launch vehicle ready for flight. You know, it, it, it really is nice, and we're really at a transition point right now, moving from the design phase into production and integrated qualification testing. You know, the, the big focus right now is component qualification testing. Uh, of the 200 components that we've got to qualify, we're through or into 80 of those, right? So a big step forward in, in getting through that component qualification phase. And, and four uh, of our integrated space spacecrafts uh, are currently in build. And I'll go through that on the next chart. But just a lot of focus. The uh, land landing test that you saw down there, we finished our first series of land landing qualification tests. First series of water landing. Obviously, normal, nominal land landing. In case of abort, you've got a ditch in the water, and so we've got to be certified for water landing also. Uh, on the bottom side, the docking system. A lot of focus now moving forward on, uh, on the plan train fly portion and, and crew training. Right? You can see uh, park chass trainers that have been delivered to Johnson Space Center. We've got the full mission simulator will be delivered um, in the spring of next year, so really uh, focusing on that. And as a testament to the uh, user-friendly nat nature of our, um, of our design, President Obama today was able to dock uh, on our mission simulator at one of his events. So uh, just a lot of movement now transitioning from the design into, uh, into production and test. <clears throat> so from a, from a qualification test article build, uh, the structural test article, uh, the, the crew module of that, uh, of that spacecraft has been delivered to the test site. The crew module uh, will be delivered by the end of the month uh, out to Huntington Beach. Uh, we'll go through about an 11-month campaign where we'll subject it to all of the structural loads, modal testing, shock, all the separation planes will be testing. So pretty extensive test campaign that uh, that test article will be fully delivered, um, as I said, at the end of the month. Uh, the next qual test articles are service module hot fire. So we're through the, uh, the initial, or almost through the initial production build footprint, moving into outfitting. <clears throat> that, uh, that test article will be built up, delivered to um, White Sands Test Facility here in uh, probably in February of next year. And it'll go through a campaign of all of the pro pro propulsion qualification series. Um, then moving on, Spacecraft One. Spacecraft One, we're through the initial production footprint. We're in outfitting of the lower dome. Critical path for our spacecraft is through the lower dome. Lower dome has uh, most of all the avionics and, uh, and environmental life support systems. So we build up the entire lower dome, go through a power on sequence to verify everything's operational before we do the mate. Uh, so we're into outfitting on that lower dome. As soon as we're done uh, building that spacecraft up next year, it'll go through uh, ground qualification testing and then on to paddleboard test. Uh, spacecraft two will be getting that dome uh, in February. So the, all the primary structure is in build right now and um, will be delivered to the factory. We'll build up uh, spacecraft two. 
it'll go out to El Segundo to the Thermovac, go through EMI, EMC, Thermovac, um, and, and acoustic vibration testing, uh, come back to Florida, and then go to orbital flight test. And then Spacecraft 3, uh, <clears throat> final spacecraft that, uh, that we're building up, be built up, go right into the crewed flight test. And then Spacecraft 2, Spacecraft 3 will cycle through uh, the different PCMs flights. So uh, a lot of encouragement uh, down on the team level that we're now into uh, building our spacecraft. So looking at the flight schedule, right? So we've um, uh, gone through a lot of hurdles on, on our technical development. Uh, looking forward, uh, looks like our paddleboard test will be uh, early 2018, you know, followed by uncrewed flight in June, uh, crewed flight test in August, and then the first services flight uh, in December of 2018. So a, a lot of progress, right? The team is, is really focused. We've um, faced into a lot of technical challenges and, and moved through a lot of them. Uh, obviously, the period that we're in now is going to, uh, going to entail some learning, right? We've had very good success on our component qual to date, but we've got to get through that phase successfully. We've got to get through the integrated qual phase successfully uh, and then get into flight. But uh, a lot of momentum building, right, as we're, as we're building the spacecraft uh, and getting ready to do our test flights. And I think that's it. Turn over to Benji. Thanks, John. Now Benji Reed from SpaceX. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Sitz. Thank you, John. Um, OK, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, again, my name is Benjamin Reed, or Benji. Everybody calls me Benji. Um, the director of commercial crew uh, mission management over SpaceX. Um, and I'll kind of, I'll jump in here, I'll let you know, I've been at SpaceX for a number of years now. I worked in the cargo program, so I'll talk in the next uh, uh, talk as well, so we'll probably kind of split up some of what I talk about here and there. But um, just to give you a, a sense of where we're at uh, for commercial crew now, um, kind of jump into it here. I always like to give a little bit of an overview, program overview, I think it helps to frame what we're doing and remind all of ourselves. Um, so first of all, uh, as partners, we're developing a, a safe and reliable, complete crew transportation system um, to certified to fly humans. And, and that's, that's, that's a really key couple of points there. We're not, it's not just a, a vehicle or a craft. What all of our jobs are here is to make sure that it's the whole system is, is certified to fly humans. It's safe and reliable. Um, and and what, what composes that system? So the key elements um, would be the Dragon, in our case it's the Dragon spacecraft, the Falcon 9 rocket, the ground system, so the launch site and all the systems associated with that, um, including all the crew access and all of that. And then all the operations. And there's a lot of different operational units that are very important to take, it, you know, take into consideration. Uh, the ground, launch, mission, crew, and recovery operations. And there's a tendency, I think, to often look at the, the space vehicle and, and think about that as being the program, and we all did that certainly with the orbiter and whatnot on shuttle too, but there's a, a massive amount of, of other work and other system that's involved to safely carry humans and, and bring them home. Um, you know, down to, you know, what are, what are the recovery vessels, uh, like in, in our case when we take them into, pick them up in the ocean, um, that sort of thing. What are, what, are the, what are all of these pieces that come together to make a whole certified system? This is very important, and, and that's what we're all working towards together to jointly make sure that's ready to go. Um, a, a couple of points of the Crew Dragon, and I actually have a, another slide to talk a little bit more about architecture in a minute. <clears throat> but um, the, the, we are flying Dragon, as we all know already, and I'll talk more about that in the next talk about cargo. But we have an upgraded version. We have our Dragon 2 vehicle being developed. And one of the, the key points of difference um, is that's worth noting up front are the Super Draco thrusters. And I think I have some sort of thing, maybe. Maybe not on here. The green button is what I The advanced. green? Oh, it's the advanced button. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, can I actually hang on really quick? Let's go back for one second. If we can go back a slide real quick. I, was, I heard there was a laser pointer. That's okay if there's not one. Okay. Um, if you look on the sides of the vehicle, um, uh, up on the, the Dragon, the middle picture there, you can kind of see those kind of black squares, kind of cutout areas. Those are the Super Draco thrusters. And those thrusters are there to provide two things. That's our integrated abort system. Um, so if you need to get off the rock and get away from the rocket in a hurry, whether you're still on the pad or if you're already in flight under launch, then those are there to do that. Um, and then also they're there to do propulsive landing. So while we'll be beginning the, the process with certifying for parachutes to water, our intent is to then certify for a propulsive landing, similar to what we're doing with our rockets right now with the first stage of the Falcon right now. And that's that picture down there in the bottom right 
you can see those are the Super Dracos actually being fired. And I'll talk a little bit more that, about that later. Um, but you can see the Super Dracos there being fired in a, in a propulsive landing test. So what's coming up? Um, the, big, the big picture, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about what's been going on in a second. But you know, the bottom line is we've got a demonstration one mission. That'll be the uncrewed mission to the space station. Um, and, uh, and so essentially a fully autonomous mission still does the, the docking and whatnot, but without crew aboard. Then we'll have an in-flight abort test. That's, we, did, we did our pad abort test uh, last year, and, and so again, that was coming off the pad uh, down at uh, Cape Canaveral. And we will be doing an in-flight abort test where we're, we, we launch it off the rocket. Um, so we, get the, we put it on a rocket, launch the rocket, and then uh, and get that thing going to where you basically get to uh, the maximum um, dynamic environment and, and then abort the vehicle. And, uh, and do that test. We'll use the Super Dracos to do that. Finally, after that, we'll do a demonstration two test. That's the test that has two crew members on it. We'll have two NASA crew uh, astronauts on there. Um, and then move right on into the operational missions where we're providing that support to the space station in, in regular increments. OK, talk a little bit about the crew architecture. Um, if you look up at the top, um, you kind of start with the spacecraft uh, segment. And notice that actually I should mention on the slides the crew and cargo architecture. So very similar uh, plan. Uh, the Dragon 2 uh, is being developed both to have a crew version and a cargo variant. Um, biggest difference, of course, is that you have no seats in the cargo variant. You have a lot more space to put cargo. Um, and so, uh, but, but generally, it's the same vehicle. Um, and so how does that look as, as an overall system? You have the, uh, the crew module at the top. Um, the top part of the vehicle, the top part of the cone of the vehicle is the, is the crew module that has the, that has the pressure section um, kind of around the base of the cone where the Super Dracos are back behind there is the service section that carries your avionics and your tanks and your plumbing and all that kind of good stuff. And then down below, if you look just below the top of the, uh, the, of the capsule itself, there's the trunk and it has these fins. Those fins are on there for aerodynamic stability in the case of uh, um, an abort, um, also give you further range. Um, and, uh, and the trunk goes with the Dragon all the way up and to the space station and then gets jettisoned just before we come back into uh, uh, back home. The trunk also has solar arrays embedded, uh, solar panels, and, uh, uh, and those are embedded so that you provide uh, power to the vehicle while on orbit. Um, again, talked about the launch abort system. Launch segment, uh, below that, of course, is the Falcon 9. And it's always, I think it's always a lot of fun to talk about launch vehicles and, and how that works, especially when you're giving tours to folks who aren't as familiar in the business or who are maybe more payload focused and less launch vehicle focused. When you really look at that, you look at the size of that vehicle and you compare it to the space vehicle, you realize that's all gas tank, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of gas tank. And again, and another piece that's always a little bit of a nuance that a lot of folks don't ever think about it, it's not about getting up there high. You know, frankly, the space station isn't that far away from us when it's going overhead, at least. Um, it's, it's about getting fast. And I think most of us probably here in this room know that. But that's why you need so much fuel, because you've got to get going fast enough to stay in orbit. Um, and so there's a lot there to, to do that, to burn all that fuel. We've got nine Merlin engines down at the bottom of the vehicle. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's one uh, uh, space uh, engine, or a vacuum engine, I should say, Merlin vacuum engine that's at the second stage. Two-stage rocket uses LOX and RP-1. Um, and then the landing legs, you can see them in black in this picture down at the bottom. And if you ever get a chance to come out to, to our Hawthorne facility for a tour, uh, or even just to drive by, you can see the, the landed vehicle down there. And you get those landing legs are huge, but if you look at them compared to the size of the rocket, again, it gives you a sense of how big the rocket is. Uh, ground and operations segment, I talked about this, super duper important, cannot forget that. Um, you can't launch a rocket, you can't manage uh, um, the, whole, the whole system without having the ground systems. Um, and so we're working out a 39A, as, um, as Stitch mentioned, as Steve mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, we're doing a lot to renovate that. Uh, we've got our launch control center down there as well. We also have our mission control center and our Hawthorne facility um, in California. Um, and those also function as their backups for one or the other. So one is a ma main for Falcon and one is a backup for Dragon and vice versa when you go to the other coast. Finally, our operations system. Um, again, all those operations team that need to be participating. I'll very quickly talk through a couple of things that we've been doing recently. We had our parachute testing, a uh, number of tests this year, more to go yet this year. Capsule qualification, we've been doing the top picture in the right is the qualification of the, of the um, 
the structure, uh, structural qualification uh, of the vehicle, of, this, of the Dragon vehicle. Propulsive landing testing, you can see that one down in the bottom. The difference there is that's a hold down test. We held the vehicle down um, on the ground while it was, and then fired the Super Dragos to understand the ground effects. Design closeouts, uh, John mentioned that as well. It's a, it's, it's a good feeling to be getting through the design, and design closeouts and lockdown, and then getting into that production and test. And that's where we're at as well. Delivered the IDA, Steve mentioned that, and getting into the post certification missions. We're already closing uh, multiple uh, reviews uh, to get ready for those missions. You can't just wait to have your first set done and then suddenly remember you got more work to do. You got to start that work now. So those reviews and milestones are ongoing. Let's go ahead and play this video, if you would, real quick. Um, this is just a few seconds. This is um, a parachute drop test that we did recently um, here in the southwest. Trying to get a sense of it coming right there out of the airplane. The first chutes you see are just for stabilization. They're part of the test. They're not actually flight. And then after those depart, we'll see the drogues. So that's just a, a test parachute there, part of the test setup. Now those are the drogues that come out. Those are the flight drogues. And then of course, they'll pull the mains. And the mains will come out. On this vehicle, we'll have four parachutes. Um, it's uh, very, uh, using heritage hardware, the same kind of stuff that we've been doing on, on uh, the cargo vehicle, except that one has three. This is a, uh, Dragon 2 is a larger vehicle, so we, uh, heavier, so we're putting uh, four on there. And that's uh, kind of a, a somewhat Dragon-shaped test article there, as well as a shape that fits in the airplane. So, uh, so that one went very well. Again, we've got a number more tests coming up. Uh, what do we have upcoming? We've got ongoing production towards Demo 1 and Demo 2. We have uh, four major um, uh, structural elements that are being developed, four major uh, what we call weldments being put together. Um, and that includes both the Demo 1 and Demo 2 flight vehicles, our structural qualification. And then moving right into our ECLIS integrated testing, we're building up a vehicle that will have the full environmental control and life support system uh, in, in place so we can test that out. Uh, spacesuit qualification, uh, continuing propulsion system testing, that upper right picture is a picture of the Super Draco's in work, and then launch site readiness, ongoing work. Launch site's looking good, uh, happy to report as well that coming off of uh, the hurricane that um, things were, were overall in, in, in pretty good shape and the teams are down there working away. So we're moving, moving on, on well for that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you here real quick with just one more, go ahead and play this. Uh, like I said, the future is coming up, uh, and, and what we're looking towards is propulsive landing. And what, the key thing to look there, and this will it'll repeat itself in a little bit slow motion, is this is hanging from a tether. And as this fires, you can see that tether slack. You can kind of see it now. It's starting to slack there. So the key part of this test is Dragon is controlling itself in three dimensions in air. So this is an actual hover test. So Dragon can actually hover on those. And that's a key part of being able to propulsively land, not only here on Earth, but across the solar system. And that's it. Great. Well, let's see. We have time for just a couple of questions. We've got a lot of questions and not much time, I'm sorry to say. Uh, let me just follow up on that last video. Both, uh, both SpaceX has talked about propulsion landing on land uh, and Boeing's uh, CST-100 lands on land. Talk a little bit, if you to Wood, John, and Benji, about uh, land landing versus water landing for a capsule. Why you came to the decisions you did. Yeah, so um, for us, reusability, um, we really felt that we needed to land on land to get reusability out of the capsule, right? When you land, land in the water, uh, you've, got, you've got uncertainty in loads. You're going into a wave that you, you don't fully understand. You've got saltwater intrusion. There's a lot of difficulty. Right, going in the land and reusing a capsule. So we, we decided to go to land for that reusability. Um, and then for, for simplicity, using parachutes and, and airbags, right? So a lot of simplicity there. You don't have to worry about, um, about the redundancy and the propulsion and, and carrying the extra propellant. But you know, that, that was just a trade that, that we made, but that was one. And Benji, for SpaceX, your thoughts on sure, the options? Um, for us, a lot of it is, uh, is, is heritage uh, as well. We've got a, a significant amount of experience launching or, and, and recovering uh, uh, the capsule on parachutes into water 
in cargo. Um, our, our team are some of the, the world experts in, in parachute landing and water recovery. So we, we knew that, that works well, so we know we can do that and repeat that. The ultimate goal, though, is that propulsive landing and, again, development of heritage and experience on the Falcon 1 vehicle. It's a different vehicle. It's a different problem, but a lot of the same lessons that we can apply. So we're looking forward to doing that. Super. Uh, here's a question that I warms the cockles of my heart. What are the biggest challenges or impediments to obtaining NASA human certification? We'll let John and Benji talk, and then we'll let Steve respond. Oh, well, Benji, go first. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biggest impediment is the certification. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's a it's a long and careful process. You have to you have to really take your time to make sure that the the requirements uh, were developed well. And NASA did a lot and spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and then that the intent and is understood and understood among all the partners and parties involved. And so we work together closely to do that. I think it's, uh, it's about making sure you meet those requirements, you understand the intent of them, and you've assessed all of the hazards and all of the safety that's critical to making sure that you can actually build a reliable system that you can carry humans on. Um, and there's, there's a process there. And so you, have, you need to work closely together as a, in a partnership um, to make sure that, that you move through those steps and at the end of the day you get to something we all feel like, yep, we're ready to go and, and, and put some of our uh, our crew on there, and uh, and send them home, and bring send, send them up, and bring them home. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that um, that we've done is very important is is bring the NASA team in fully, um, so they they get awareness through the design process, right? So that it's not uh, it's not something new to them. You know, really, when you look at the risks, the devils in the details, right? The requirements are clear; they've been stable. There's a great partnership across the two teams. But when you, when you go to the VCN or the, the actual document that you're preparing your certification evidence, right, it is that working through you know, hundreds of those and the partnership with the NASA engineering team um, on the determination of what is enough, you know, how much analysis, how much test, and, and making sure that's fully understood across uh, the hundreds of requirements that you've got to go prove. Um, and, and so we're making sure we're working through those early so that we've got that agreement um, on a case-by-case -case basis early. Yeah, and I, I would sort of echo what John and Benji both said from my perspective. It really is going to be a, a team approach. Of both partners have been great at, at letting us understand their design, see their testing in many cases. And then it's going to come down to, with the volume of requirements we have and the volume of data that, uh, will be required to go through those, communicating very clearly and agreeing on what's required for each one of those requirements, and then methodically working through it. Uh, from a NASA perspective, uh, it's exciting for me. We've got two launch vehicles and two spacecraft that we're certifying. So uh, when you think about it from that perspective, with a relatively small team and a new innovative approach, um, it'll be a lot of fun and a great challenge to, to get through that. Well, I would like to, there's some more great questions, but once again, we are out of time here. So I want to thank the panel for their discussion of the commercial crew program and its status. Thank you.